of world news tonight. Deadly blast. Suspect detained in connection to the fatal attack on Jehovah's Witness gathering in India. Anti-Semitic attacks. Mobs stormed the Russian airport in search of Israelis as hostilities targeting Jews surge across the globe. Back to work. China's Shenzhou 16 astronauts land safely after five months aboard Tiangong space station. And trick or treat. Biden celebrate their first Halloween at the White House. is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off tonight's broadcast with updates on the unfortunate situation unfolding in India. Police in India have arrested a man in connection with a series of explosions at a Jehovah's Witnesses meeting in the southern state of Kerala. Three people were killed and more than 50 were injured in the blast at a program held by the Christian-based religious movement. Police said that the man, Dominic Martin, was arrested under an anti-terror law. He had earlier posted a video claiming responsibility for the attacks and surrendered to the police. The blast took place during the last day of a prayer session organized by Jehovah's Witnesses in the town of Kalamassari. More than 2,000 people were attending the three-day event. A regional spokesperson for the Jehovah's Witnesses told local media that the first blast took place in the middle of a hall and two more explosions took place seconds later on either side of the hall. Two women who attended the meeting died while a 12-year-old girl with 95% burns succumbed to her injuries soon afterwards. Local police stated that the suspect was from Kerala and had worked in Dubai earlier. The blast sent shockwaves across the country and security was stepped up in Delhi, Mumbai and other cities. Next in Russia, a mob looking for Israelis and Jews overran an airport in Russia's Caucasus Republic of Dagestan today after rumors spread that a flight was arriving from Israel. It began with news that a flight from Israel was landing in Dagestan's capital. In this majority Muslim Republic of the Russian Federation, there's been anger over the Israeli bombardment of Gaza. On Sunday evening, hundreds of people, some waving Palestinian flags, stormed the airport. They broke through doors and barriers. Some rushed onto the runway and surrounded a plane that had flown in from Tel Aviv. Security services shut down the airport and cleared it. Around 20 people were injured in the riot, but the passengers on the plane were safe. Dagestan's chief Muslim cleric called for calm. He said he was concerned for Muslims and children dying in Palestine, but the conflict would not be resolved by such actions. We will talk with the relevant people and we'll continue to try to resolve this issue differently. Not with emotions, not with rallies, but in an appropriate way. The Dagestani government held an emergency meeting after the riot. It says it's strengthening security across the region and the airport will remain closed for another week. I don't understand the young people that went out to the airport. If they have any opinion or insight on issues, well, there are official ways of organizing protests. There are laws for this. The office of the Israeli Prime Minister has demanded action from Russia, saying in a statement that Israel expects the Russian authorities to protect all Israeli citizens and all Jews and to act decisively against the rioters and against incitement to violence against Jews and Israelis. Russia's Federal Investigations Agency has ordered a criminal investigation. U.S. President Joe Biden has issued a sweeping executive order to regulate the development of artificial intelligence amid growing concern about its potential impact on everything from national security to public health. To realize the promise of AI and avoid the risk, we need to govern this technology. U.S. President Joe Biden signed a new executive order at the White House on Monday that seeks to reduce the risks that artificial intelligence poses to Americans and national security. The order requires developers of AI systems to share the results of safety tests with the U.S. government before they are released to the public. It also directs agencies to set standards for that testing 
and address related chemical, biological, nuclear, and cybersecurity risks. In the wrong hands, AI can make it easier to, for hackers to exploit vulnerabilities in the software that makes our, our society run. The move is the latest step by the Biden administration to set parameters around AI as it makes rapid gains in capability and popularity in an environment of so far limited regulation. The new order goes beyond voluntary commitments made earlier this year by AI companies such as OpenAI, Google Parent Alphabet, and Meta Platforms, which all pledged to label content that is AI generated. It's already happening. AI devices are being used to deceive people. Deep fakes use AI generated audio and video to smear reputations. I've watched one of me on a couple of times. I said, when the hell did I say that? Biden said his executive order will seek to address the risk of bias and civil rights violations that AI poses. That means clear guidance for landlords and federal contractors and federal programs to prevent the bias and AI tools that can be used to make decisions on whether or not someone qualifies for housing or benefits or a job. He also called on Congress to pass legislation to regulate AI, in particular on data privacy. Moving on to the Road to the White House, where we bring you the latest U.S. election updates. Over in Colorado now, U.S., a trial began to determine whether former U.S. President Donald Trump is disqualified from the state's ballot in the 2024 election over his purported role in a deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol aimed at keeping him in office. A long-shot bid to disqualify former President Donald Trump from appearing on Colorado's 2024 ballots began in a Denver courtroom on Monday. The case will test a rarely used Civil War era provision of the U.S. Constitution that bars people who have engaged in insurrection or rebellion from holding federal office. Plaintiff's attorney Scott Olson argued Trump assembled a violent mob at the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, that tried to prevent the constitutional transfer of power. And we are here because Trump claims, after all that, he has the right to be president again. But our Constitution, our shared charter of our nation, says he cannot do so. And Colorado law says this court must ensure that only eligible candidates appear on our ballots. Trump faces similar lawsuits brought by advocacy groups in Michigan and Minnesota, but the Colorado case is the first to go to trial. Trump is the leading Republican candidate for president in 2024 and has denied wrongdoing during the attack on the Capitol by a mob of his supporters who wanted to prevent Congress from certifying Democrat Joe Biden's November 2020 presidential election win. A lawyer for Trump, Scott Gessler, denied that Trump incited supporters to violence and said it would set a dangerous precedent to disqualify him. And frankly, they're asking this court to be the first in the country ever to embrace a number of legal theories that have never been accepted by a court, state or federal. Many legal experts call the strategy a long shot. Even if the plaintiffs prevail, the final say would likely rest with a U.S. Supreme Court dominated by a 6-3 conservative majority that includes three Trump appointees. The trial before a Denver judge is expected to last one week. Updates on the Israel-Hamas war front now. Israeli ground operations are expanding in Gaza, including the rescue of a soldier taken hostage by Hamas. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that a ceasefire would be the same as surrendering to Hamas. An Israeli soldier who was kidnapped by Hamas during the October 7th attack has been rescued as the Israeli Defense Forces, Special Forces and the Shin Bet Intelligence Agency conducted a ground operation in Gaza on Sunday night. Private Yuri Megadish is the first soldier rescued by Israel since more than 200 people, including dozens of Israeli soldiers, were taken by Hamas. Megadish was a member of a unit of female soldiers in charge of monitoring the Gaza border via surveillance cameras. The Israeli military says she's in good health and has met with her family. 
Despite the international community calling for a humanitarian ceasefire in the Gaza Strip, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will not agree to a ceasefire, as it would be equivalent to surrendering to Hamas and terrorism. During a press conference on Monday, the Prime Minister went on to condemn Hamas for trying to destroy the promise of Israel's future. He added that just as the United States would not agree to a ceasefire after the bombing of Pearl Harbor or the September 11th terrorist attack, Israel will continue to fight. Meanwhile, the Israeli military announced on Monday that it had sent additional troops to the Gaza Strip as it strengthened ground operations in the Palestinian enclave. In a statement released by the military, it said that additional troops were deployed as it looks to achieve its war goals. In addition, the military announced that the head of the IDF Southern Command, Major General Yaron Finkelman, went into the Gaza Strip to assess the ground combat situation. Welcome back. Next, we have grim updates from Axapulso, Mexico. The number of people dead and missing due to Hurricane Otis, a Category 5 storm, has risen to nearly 100. The death toll is expected to be increased in the coming days. Meteorologists say it was one of the most rapidly intensifying hurricanes on record, with heavy rains and winds of up to 270 kilometers an hour. Residents say they'll take months to recover. I just want to go home because I worked really hard to build my little house. I'm alone. I don't have anyone else. We all agreed we're going to unite as neighbors to pick up everything that's in the way so that we can get through and wait for any help that may arrive. All we can think about is where we will get the money from to rebuild what we used to have. Right now, we are seeing how we're going to be able to work. First and foremost, we need to fix the roof. And then with the little produce that survived, we will start working again. That's the only thing that we can do. Google CEO Sundar Pichai acknowledged the importance of making its search engine the default in keeping users loyal. The historic testimony comes as a key point in a once-in-a-generation U.S. antitrust fight focused on billions of dollars the search engine paid to be the default on laptops and smartphones. The CEO of Google has testified in what may become a key moment in the company's once-in-a-lifetime antitrust battle with the U.S. government. This was Sundar Pichai leaving court in Washington Monday. The lawsuit focuses on the billions of dollars that Google has paid to companies to be the default search engine on various phones and computers. The big moment was because Pichai acknowledged under questioning by federal prosecutors that being the default was important for keeping users glued to Google products. The case is over whether Google acted illegally to maintain its market dominance of search engines and some types of online advertising. The government argues Google used agreements with companies like Apple to cut out rival search engines in a way that breaks antitrust law. If Google loses, it may be forced to scrap some of its business practices. The company argues that when people don't like default search engines, they can switch to another. In early October, the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, testified that his company had tried to make its Bing search engine the default on Apple smartphones, but was rebuffed. And he dismissed Google's argument that it's easy to change defaults on devices as bogus. And updates on China's space excursion next. Three Chinese astronauts aboard the Zhengzhou 16 spacecraft's return capsule made it back to Earth today after five months in space. The astronauts touched down at China's Dongfeng landing site and their descent was eased by a large parachute. The capsule landed in the barren Gobi Desert, kicking up a cloud of orange dust. 
The three astronauts had launched into space on May 30th and were in orbit for 154 days. They conducted scientific experiments and carried out a near eight-hour spacewalk during their time in space. Chinese news reports showed that they had successfully grown tomatoes, lettuce and green onions in space as part of their experiments. Last week, China launched its Shenzhou 17 mission with three astronauts, reportedly China's youngest crew till date, to replace Shenzhou 16 astronauts. This was the second crew change since the station was commissioned earlier this year. China has renewed its space ambitions in competition with the US and Russia and aims to send a manned spacecraft to the moon by 2030. In other related news now, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said that his country was willing to invest in gas and critical minerals in Nigeria, Africa's largest oil producer. He also started a two-nation visit to sub-Saharan Africa. Germany is willing to invest in gas and critical minerals in Nigeria. That's according to German Chancellor Olaf Scholz on Sunday as he started a two-nation visit to sub-Saharan Africa. This is his third visit to the region in two years. It comes as conflicts elsewhere highlight the growing importance of an energy-rich region in which Berlin has traditionally had little involvement. Nigeria is Africa's largest oil producer. On gas, Schultz welcomed Nigeria's efforts to expand its LNG capacity. We have a very good bilateral. Nigerian President Bola Tinubu said he had a very deep discussion on the issue of gas and encouraged German businesses to invest in pipelines in Nigeria. Nigeria is also seeking to woo investors to its mining sector, which has long been underdeveloped, contributing less than 1% to the country's gross domestic product. Without giving details, Schultz said there was also a willingness from German companies to build railways in Nigeria. That sector is currently dominated by Chinese companies, which have won contracts to expand rail lines in Africa's biggest economy. Welcome back. Two people were injured in a shooting at a hospital at the central Japanese city of Toda. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. Two people have been injured in a shooting at a hospital in the central Japanese city of Toda. Britain's King Charles is set to begin a four-day state visit to Kenya, a former colony during which he plans to acknowledge painful aspects of a shared history that include almost seven decades of colonial rule. Two people have been killed and dozens of homes were destroyed in bushfires raging across Australia's northern Queensland state. Apple introduced a new MacBook Pro and iMac computers and three new chips to power them, with the company saying that it had redesigned its graphics processing units. A New Zealand court found the management company of White Island, where a volcano erupted in 2019, killed 22 people, mostly tourists, guilty of one charge of breaching health and safety law. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. We're leaving you tonight in Washington, D.C., USA, as the White House came alive with Halloween spirit as gray skies and drizzle added a spooky element to the eve of the holiday. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.